I'm going to go ahead and, and read the scripture leading up to Carl's sermon. Um, we're going to be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 10. So if you want to take a second and open your Bibles up, uh, the words will be up on the screen as well. And if you notice, we're reading from the TLV, which is the Tree of Life version. Um, you're going to hear some words that are a little bit different in there, um, like the word ruach. Um, is Hebrew for spirit, uh, and you'll see uh, Messiah, Messiah Yeshua, which is Jesus. Um, so just a couple of different words that you'll see in there, um, but let's go ahead and dive in. So this is 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 10. Now the Ruach clearly says that in times, that in later times, some will fall away from the faith following deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of false teachers whose own conscience has been seared. They forbid people to marry. They command people to abstain from foods that God created for the faithful to share with thanksgiving, having come to know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. In pointing out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Messiah Yeshua, nurtured in the words of the faith and the sound teaching that you have been following. But avoid godliness, godless myths, and old wives' tales. Instead, Train yourselves in godliness, for physical exercise has some benefit, but godliness is beneficial for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the one to come. Trustworthy is the saying, and deserving of complete acceptance, for to this end we work hard and strive. We have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who trust. It is good to to see you out there. Um, The last several weeks have been uh, strange, as uh, Nick uh, talked about. Um, Nick was actually like the production manager for me during these last several weeks. so that very first Sunday, he and I did both work on Sunday. We came here and recorded uh, the, the sermon. Other than that, you know, we weren't, you know, at, at the church. It, uh, it, it feels different today, too, just there's more things to hook up. And, and, uh, and I know for me, as I thought about, you know, preaching live again, uh, I, this week I was kind of thinking, so is that going to be hard or am I going to get nervous and uh, and I and I, I was telling myself okay you know what I need to talk slow anyway I, I've tried to work on that in the videos so I'm going to try to do that a little bit more today and and it is it feels uh, really awesome to actually be here and not talking and looking at the camera uh, there's a there was one time um, we had the light on the camera on and I'm staring at the camera and then I go to read the scripture and I get this big dot in my, you know, because the, the, there's a light on there and I could hardly even read the scripture. So, uh, it, yeah, it's it's fun to actually see uh, real live people out there. There's Stolzfuses and, you know, Millers and it's like, wow, incredible. Um, let's just bow and I'd like to pray for the sermon now. Lord God just ask for your blessing as we we look at these these verses and Paul's words to Timothy and what we can glean from them for our lives today there's a lot in there I just ask for your blessing on my thought process and the words that kind of my, that come out of my mouth that they be the words you want me to say and that your Holy Spirit just be active and present to help people get your message, regardless of what I say. And I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay. Um, sermon title is Working Hard. And 
we'll get to why I, I named it that. There's a lot in here about um, training, uh, training yourself and godliness, and, and, and there's, so there's definitely that part of working hard. Uh, Paul's also talking about working hard also in the sense that he has worked hard in his life and had to overcome a lot of adversity. So I think there's, there's a, a lot of that going on there too. Now, as, as we looking at, at these uh, verses here, that in your bulletin, there are some fill in the blanks. And if, if you've got them, th this is the, the first one. When we were looking at chapter one, there's a part there where Paul's talking to Timothy and he's talking about some people who have shipwrecked their faith. And he talks in there, he says, ignoring conscience leads to destroyed faith. And of course, um, faith you're talking about faith and the definition there is just relying on what God wants you to do and everything. And you don't have to have all the answers, but you're just by, by faith, you realize, well, God has the answers. He's got this. I'm, I'm just going to do what he wants me to do. The whole conscience thing uh, turns out to be, um, even if, if you did not grow up in a Christian home, you're still made in God's image. And so there's this little inner voice, even if you don't know any better, that tries to tell you right from wrong, okay? And, and then for us, we grew up in a Christian home, we call ourselves Christians, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and it is Pentecost Sunday, the giving of the Holy Spirit, that's available for all believers, and so we've got God's Spirit living within us, and so that conscience is God's Spirit. Um, and just nudging us saying, whoa, you know, that's what you want to do, and well, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, it's that conscience. If you ignore the conscience, that leads to having your faith destroyed. And, and so that's from chapter 1. And, and as you look at these first uh, several verses, like in your bulletin, the first five verses, Paul is talking about uh, false teachings, and he, he names, names a few different things. And, 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 he, and what he ends up saying about, about that is that false teaching uh, leads to destroyed faith. And that, that's, that's today in this chapter, verses 1 and 2. Um, and so, and, and you have to think, okay, so you think, well, what's a false teaching then? I mean, uh, I doubt any of you are picking up some weird book and acting like that's the gospel message. But let me give you a couple of examples of false teachings that happen in the Christian uh, arena. Uh, one of those would be the wealth and health gospel. The idea that, well, hey, you know what? If I'm following God, he's going to bless me and I'm going to get rich. There's an awful lot of uh, destitute, genuine Christians out there who are financially broke. Okay, so the, uh, and, and, and the health part of that, you've often, or maybe you haven't, but I sure have heard people talk about, oh, well, you know, if you have enough faith, then you're going to have good health too. There's a lot of dying people out there that are great faith and stuff like that, but sometimes that's not God's will. So that would certainly be one example of, of a, a false teaching you know, from our day. Um, other examples would be the idea that, well, you know, if I could just be good enough. I mean, I'm, I'm a good person and surely that's going to be good enough. And, and if I have enough good, that outweighs the bad. That's not how salvation works. It's giving your life to Jesus that's going to count, uh, not weighing your good against the bad. So again, that's a false teaching. Um, another one would be the idea that, that uh, hey, you know what? If, if, I, if I just work at this hard enough and I, and I can do it all in my own strength and I'm going to be okay. And, and if somebody's failing, they just didn't have enough strength and it should have worked a little bit harder. Okay, that's a false teaching too because... The Bible tells us we need each other and we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, need, we need the strength of Jesus in order, and then that's going to be sufficient to get by, but not on my own strength. And certainly it's okay and, and wanted to have encouragement and inspiration of others. Uh, for any of you who did do a lot of self-isolation, um, and if you didn't pick up your phone or talk to other Christians, you're going to feel some of this too. All right. So... There are false teachings out there. I, I just named some. There would be others also. So we also have these false teachings. But false teachings lead to destroyed faith. And then what he ends up saying in these first five verses is that false teachers 
have hardened consciences. Okay, so a hardened conscience. He, he says the conscience is seared. Uh, what would that look like? What, uh, when I think about uh, some of the, thinking about a conscience and, and having my conscience seared, um, I'm, I'm going to go think back to when I was in, in college. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I grew up a uh, pastor's kid, you know, pastor's home. Um, basically, I was a rule follower, all that kind of stuff. I get to college, and I, and I was still basically that. I, I didn't do anything that I couldn't tell you about that, that I wouldn't, I'm not necessarily proud of, but it's not like you would lynch me, okay? But what I remember in college, I remember at one point thinking, wow, my language has really slipped. And again, I could tell you what some of those words are now, and I don't think any bad at eye, most of you are using the same words, okay? But it didn't feel good to me because that's not what, how I was brought up, and it wasn't what I expected out of myself. So how did I get to that point? Well, everybody else is using language. Everybody else is using, saying stuff. You know, uh, some of it's not, not very uplifting to God or uplifting to other people. And you know what? So you start doing that, and then pretty soon your conscience gets seared. It gets hardened to the point where it becomes everyday language, everyday speech. And all of a sudden you're thinking, whoa, I'm saying this kind of thing? Well, three years ago, I never would have thought of saying something like that. Okay, so that happens. So language is certainly one way that happens. Uh, I, I grew up in a Christian home and all that kind of stuff. So for me, I always knew, hey, you know what? I'm supposed to be giving my money uh, to God, you know? And, and again, was taught the 10% Old Testament concept. No problem with that, you know? I was taught that. That's what we call the tithe and stuff. And so, you know, even when I, uh, I delivered papers and stuff like that, you know, I understood. I took 10% of that, gave it to the church. Okay. So I grew up with that, but you know what? Uh, if there gets a point in your life where you're starting to think oh, financially, I don't know if I can give, maybe I can't give the full amount, or maybe I can't give this Sunday. And so you take a Sunday, okay, I can't give. And then the next week you can't. And again, your conscience gets hardened and seared the more you follow that. So there would be a, another example. Uh, even the whole idea about going to church. I mean, I haven't been to church for 10 weeks. That first week I was, you know, right? But if, if that becomes a habit in your life and you're not going to church, and pretty soon your conscience isn't telling you anymore because you're ignoring your conscience. Paul's thing here is that false teachers have these hardened consciences. So, so they, they think they're doing everything all fine, and then they're telling other people, this is the way you need to live, but that's not right, okay? So Paul's whole point here is that these hardened consciences can be really detrimental uh, to your faith. Um, now, I'm going to look at these next several verses, and I'm just going to want to point out a few things. Uh, as verse 6 starts out, in pointing out these things, he's talking about the false teachers, okay? So he's talking about, okay, you've got these false teachers here. And these false teachers... He needs to try to help the Ephesians recognize what's going on. So in pointing out these things, he's talking about these false teachers. It's interesting, the Greek here, uh, there's actually, there's only about two Greek words in this, this whole five words that are highlighted, okay? And, and the one is things, and, and the other is in pointing out. Uh, that also can be talked about in laying down, like you're laying groundwork, or in laying this out. And the, the, uh, this Greek word that's used here um, would be the idea, if you're on treacherous ground and you lay stepping stones to cover the treacherous ground so that you don't get your feet muddy or wet or whatever, this treacherous ground, now you can step. That's the Greek word, okay? And so what he's recognized is these false teachers, th there's a lot of false teaching out there and it's treacherous because it's going to be treacherous to your faith. And so in laying out, in laying stepping stones for your people, Timothy, this is what you need to be aware of. So that's what he's trying to say here. So then he says, in pointing out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Messiah Yeshua, or that's, that's Jesus. Nourished in the words of the faith, and the sound teaching that you've been following. 
uh, this, the word nourish can also be translated as train. Um, so you've got this idea about being trained in the words of the faith and the sound teaching. The words of the faith, uh, the gospel message about what it means to rely on God and the sound teaching. He's talking about the sound teaching that Paul would have given them that, you know what, Jesus came to die for your sins and you don't have to do anything other than surrender to him and then you're saved. And, and that, in a nutshell, that's this gospel message. That's the sound teaching. Anything else that comes in there that says, yeah, but you still have to follow these rules, and you still have to be good enough, and you still have to, that's not part of the gospel message. And so he, he wants that, that to be known. Um, so now I'm, I'm going to go on then to uh, uh, chapter, uh, verse 7, I'm gonna, but I'm going to read 6 along with it. In pointing out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Messiah Yeshua, nourished in the words of the faith and sound teaching that you have been following, but avoid godless myths and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself in godliness. Okay, uh, that's the, another fill-in-the-blank in your bulletin. Train yourself in godliness. Let's, uh, let, me, let me go to this then. This is another fill-in-the-blank. Here's a definition for godliness. Godliness means a life totally consecrated to God. Now, consecrated is a church term, but we don't use it very much. Let me say it this way then. Godliness is a life totally set apart to God. That you take your life and you take every aspect of it and think about what that means then. Every aspect. Every word that comes out, every business dealing, every greeting you give somebody, every minute, every bunch of your time, every bunch of your money, every aspect of your God is set up, of your life is set apart to God. That's godliness. Okay? So what he's saying here? Train yourself in godliness. Train yourself to be able to have that kind of a life. Um so the, this, this week, uh, I had a chance to see Jason and Sarah Smoker. I had not seen them for years. Uh, they came to visit Gary because Gary's getting close to death. Uh, so they came from Kansas uh, to visit him because they, 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 they've been close. Uh, they stopped into the office. Uh, Jason told me uh, there wasn't anybody else to visit. They thought they'd see Kim, but she wasn't there. So <laughs> and that's actually what he said. So uh, here I am. I got a chance to visit with, with Jason and Sarah for a while. Now... Jason's, I know Jason's been a big runner. I'm not a runner, okay? I know he's, he's been a big runner. If I'm not mistaken, I'll look over at Kevin to see if this is right. Didn't he one time in one day run 56 miles in one day? Yes, okay. So that's the kind of runner that Jason's been. All right, so I just asked him about his running. I want to know, you still running? I figured he was. Uh, it's not like he was, you know, grossly overweight or anything. <laughs> he still looks the same, right? And he said, yeah, you know, he, he's been running. Uh, he had been training to run at the Grand Canyon to run from rim to rim with a couple of the guys, you know, in Kansas. And he's already, he's done this before. Jason's done this before. Uh, but then, then COVID-19 happened, and so he had to put that on hold. So I asked him, so what are you running now? Now, gather, he's running now, and we're not training. He was training. So when he's just running now, six miles a day, five days a week. That's not training. That's 30 miles of running a week, and that's not training. When he's training, it's something totally more because you're working towards something, and that's what training's all about. Training doesn't just happen. You have to decide you're going to train, and you're going to work to be able to train. So I, I, I tried to think, okay, so how can I talk to you about train yourself in godliness? What does that mean? Uh, we had a Zoom call sermon not too long ago that, that Nick and I did together, and I think we had some good, good suggestions there. And I thought, okay, what, well, just use the same ones? And I thought, you know what? Maybe what I ought to do, I'll just talk for me personally, what does it mean to train in godliness, okay? Uh, now, some of this you're, you're going to know because I, I've said some of these things before. So when I think about training for godliness in my own life, I think about Bible reading. That's just who I am. I love to read the Bible. I love to read a bunch of different Bibles. Um, I was going to count in my office. 
I don't know if I have 19 or 20 different translations of the Bible in my office. I think I do. I mean, you're talking hard copy. I think I do. I, I went back and looked because I, I keep track of, of what I read. I'm a closet accountant. I'm trying to live up to be Jeff Mowry someday, you know. So, I mean, so I keep track of stuff, okay? And in, in the years that I started pastoring, so for 33 years, I've read the Bible in, this is my 16th different translation that I'm reading in this year, okay? I mean, I don't read it all in, in the same translation. And that's because... I want to know if there's something different. I want to know if I'm supposed to hear it in a different voice. And so I do that. I love buying Bibles. I love reading the Bible. So for me, that's what works. Um, what other ways do I do train in godliness? Um, since, since Nick came, we just talked about it. I don't know, was this week or last week? Might have been, might have been last week. We just talked about when, when all the weird stuff quits and we're more back to more of a normal schedule uh, we want to be able to do some book book reading together where we can study some stuff and then talk about it together and learn i mean to me that's still training in godliness um, it, it's a plan where there's someone you're working with and so you can't decide to slough off this week i mean so there's accountability that goes on with with training in godliness um, <laughs> For me also, it's the idea of, of having an active prayer life, uh, not focusing on me, and not focusing on me doing all the talking, but me having time to listen to what God wants to say to me. Again, so for me, those are certainly several things that for me are, are very important as I train in Godliness. There's a lot of different other things. I don't normally journal. Occasionally I, I, I might, but just... Normally, that's not my thing. I know that that's also could be a good thing to help train in godliness. Um, I uh, uh, Working with a group, accountability partner, you know, uh, doing book studies together, th those are all ways that I know work. There are other ways, but the point would be we are being asked to train in godliness. How do you train yourself in godliness? I mean, that, that's just a question. So you got to think, what works for you? And maybe a better way to ask it then is, how is God calling you to train for a godly life? Because maybe he's calling you to do something you don't really want to do because it takes too much time or it's too much effort. But maybe that's the question that needs to be answered in your life. What is it that God's calling you to do to be able to train for a godly life? Now, um, going on to, to verse 8, uh, this, is the, this is the, for physical exercise has some benefit. Okay, yeah, that's great. But he's not talking about physical exercise. But godliness is beneficial for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the one to come. So here's the fill in the blank. Godliness holds promise for the present and future life. Now, here. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Um, uh, Thirty some years ago, when I started started being a pastor, um, I was in, in a church in Illinois, and uh, I mean, I mean, shoot, I was twenty six, right? And the elders, I think the youngest one was older than my grandpa. Let's put it that way, right? And then there are others older than that. And as we talked about their experience of coming to know God, all of them had the experience, had the experience of going to a tent revival where they got scared into being saved. They wanted to avoid hell, and that's why they got saved. Now, I'm saying that in a very prejudiced way. I don't think that's why you're supposed to get saved, okay? I don't think you're supposed to get saved to avoid hell, <laughs> okay? But that was their experience. That's where godliness holds promise for the future life. Yeah, you get a future life. But I think it's so important what this verse is actually saying because this verse is actually saying that, you know what? Oops, I shouldn't have gone that way. It's good for this life, too. Not just the present life. 
it's good for this life. All right, so how does God of this hold promise for the present life? It gives you God's purpose in your life. If you become a believer and you have God in your heart, then you're supposed to ask him, well, what do you want me to do? Not what career do I want to do? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to make my money? What do you want me to do with that money? How do I raise a family? Do I have a family? All that's God's decision, not your own. So there's God's purpose in your life. And then that brings God's contentment and fulfillment in your life. That's what it means why Godliness holds promise for the present life. It doesn't mean you're not going to get sick, you're not going to die, you're not going to break your, your ankle or what. It doesn't mean any of that. But it does mean whatever happens in this life, you've got God right there with you. You're not doing anything alone. You're not doing it on your own strength. You're doing it on Jesus' strength from our verse in Philippians 4.13. That's what it means to have that godly life. And that's why it holds promise for the present life. So continuing on, uh, 9 and 10. So now he's going to say, uh, Paul has this saying he wants to give at the end. So he's going to preface it by saying, well, trustworthy is the saying and deserving of complete acceptance. And he hasn't got to the saying yet, you know. And then he has, uh, for to this end we work hard and strive. Um, here, this is a slab of marble. This is what came out of the marble. You can see the drawings on the marble. You know, you got this slab, and then a sculptor's going to sit there and chisel it out till it looks like that. Guess what? This slab of marble, it doesn't turn into that just by looking at it. It takes work. It takes a plan. It takes effort. That's what Paul's saying here when he talks about the striving and the working. It's what Paul did for God with his life because God told him to. He worked hard. He had God's plan for his life. I mean, that was after... And that was after his name was Saul. That was after the, the light. That was after Damascus. And now he's Paul. And now he's got God's plan, not his own. And some of it was hard work. The beatings that he took, the shipwrecks that he took, that's what he's talking about there. And then he gets to this. So now we get, this is the saying. We have set our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all all people, especially those who trust. We have set our hope on the living God. What does it mean then to set our hope on the living God? Where do you place your hope? When I think about placing my hope on the living God, uh, in, in today's world, okay, uh, you got the virus, uh, you've got the situation going on in Minneapolis, which is a, a recurring situation from across the country. For me, it means I'm going to place my hope on Jesus. And I'm going to imitate Jesus and act like Jesus no matter what else is going on. No matter if there's a virus or not a virus. What I mean by that is this. If God in the midst of this virus wants me to go into some other place and talk to somebody and lay my hands on and pray for them, I'm going to do that. I don't care about the virus. That's me. That's my calling. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Same thing with race riots or injustice or anything else out there. I can't let those things determine where I hang my hope. My hope is set on Jesus. I will do whatever he wants me to do, regardless of what is going on around the world or in my neighborhood or in my house. That's what it means to set our hope on the living God. Not the God who is dead and gone and doesn't care about the world. No, this is the living God who came himself in human form so that I don't have to take punishment for what I did and what I deserve to be punished for. So where do you place your hope? How is God calling you to place your hope in Him? 
And that's a question you'll have to answer. No one can answer that question for you. In closing, I would say this. Let us commit to this. Like, I'm committing to this. I'm asking, will you join me? I want us to hear our conscience. Pay attention to God's voice within your life. What is God's voice telling you? Let's commit to hearing our conscience. Let's commit to, to a sound teaching from the Bible. The sound teaching from the Bible means whatever you hear out there, you look at it against the Bible. What does the Bible say about this? How did Jesus act? Does it even make any sense according to what's in the Bible? Sound teaching from the Bible, not necessarily it's something you're going to hear somewhere else. It's got it's to fit with what the Bible is. Let us commit to train to live godly lives. Train means doing more than you would normally mean. For Jason, that means running a lot more than 30 miles a week if he's going to train for something. But that's for all of us then. Train. It's not going to happen on its own. You're not going to get closer to God on, on, on your own, on your own time. It's going to take some of your time. It's going to take some of your effort. But then you're re re rewarded because you get closer to God. And then let us commit to set our hope on the living God and not on anything else out there. Our hope has to be on the living God. What, I, what I'd like to do, I'm, that's going to be the end of the service here. Uh, I'm going to have a, a closing prayer. At the end of that, you are, are free to go. Um, what I would say is this. I do have a mask, and I do have some hand purifier. I'm going to go use it and put the mask on. If you want prayer, come up. If you don't want me to touch you, but you want to pray, that is fine. Just tell me. I just want you to, your prayer is available. If you would like to have prayer on anything, something that was said today or something going on in your life, I just want you to be able to have that. So please bow with me in prayer. Lord God, I want to thank you for the way that you are here. I want to thank you for each person who's able to hear the message. And I just, I just pray that your Holy Spirit which is rich and alive and in every believer, that your Holy Spirit glean the parts that people need to hear for their own lives and how to train and grow and live with our hope set on you. Bless us as we go from here that we can feel your presence. Uh, bless us as we go from here that we can understand what it is you are asking of each of us individually day by day and give us the grace and the boldness to go do it. I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.